let's get started. First and foremost, um, we got to advance the slide somehow. Come on, Johnny. You've done this before. There we go. All right. So basically, um, trading's risky. This is a very important risk disclosure statement. I'm still registered as a CTA, and the CFTC and the NFA would like me to make sure that you understand that uh, trading is risky and that this uh, presentation is educational and purposes. Past performance is not indicative of results, and it's unlawful to reproduce, distribute, or exhibit this material, and blah, 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 blah. You guys take a second to read this. Very important information. And with that said, Three, two, one, next. All right, so anyway, a um, bit of history. I've written some books that were, I guess, groundbreaking. Um, this is the book, actually, that uh, we were discussing. Uh, this is the one that uh, was written about 11 years ago, uh, and that's the one that did the, the, it was the first in the world to do even a back test or look at the relevance of, of candles and pivot point analysis. So. Um, we created a few uh, indicators, and uh, what we're going to talk about is some of those indicators and the scans and, and the features that we can use and the scanning capability with Genesis, the back testing capabilities. I mean, it really is a robust trading uh, application platform and, and analytic platform. So I came out with this book about now it's going to be two years, Mastering Stock Market. We've talked a lot about uh, market timing uh, tools that I use and um, in addition as Pete mentioned I was the contributing editor for the Commodity Traders Almanac which really took um, a lot of people by surprise that were as the title says commodities but the funny thing is it was really about stock sector that and individual underlying stocks that correlated to um, the seasonality in commodities that back in the time eight years ago it was very very little um, I guess publicity was given to that. And when I gave presentations and talked, how many people are trading soybeans? It's like, you know, six, seven hundred people would be at these, these events. And, you know, two people would raise their hand saying, yeah, I trade soybeans. And everyone else would be like, no, I'm not touching commodities. And then when I asked, how does everyone relate to maybe trading John Deere or potash? And at the time, potash was like $250, 240 230 in that range. Man, you just everyone was interested in that stock because it was just a big momentum, and of course it was it was in July and the market started to break down. And um, I was telling people, listen, those stocks are highly correlated to the seasonal trend of the underlying market in soybeans and corn, in which, by the way, folks, has a very poor performance. In fact, has a strong seasonal tendency to decline this time of year. And about six months later, I think potash at that presentation went from about I think 240 to about maybe $60. Anyway, um, the the work many of you have probably, if you've been to Traders Expos, you've seen me before and uh, things of that nature. And we've done some some work, as Pete said, with different uh, uh, indicators. So with that said, um, I think out of my whole career, and it's now been 35 years, I started at the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, you know, it was kind of an honor to find that Stock Traders Almanac actually uh, dedicated an issue that's the oldest and most respected financial publication is the Stock Traders Almanac. Yale Hirsch started this 40 as you know 47 years ago, and they dedicated uh, the book to me. So I I, I think as you know, a, a, apart from my own trading successes from the early days back in the 80s, I first started trading options uh, on Treasury bond futures when they started in '84. I had the fortune. Uh, uh, a fortunate opportunity to work with George Lane for a couple of years. George was the creator uh, or innovator of the indicator you may use is known as stochastics. Um, so being around in that day and age with a lot of uh, people, I'm going to give a name out. I, I barely talk about this guy's name. His name was um, Ellis Pixley Luke, an individual trader. I think at the time, I think his family like either started, founded, or owned like most of Barrington at, back in the 1800s. Um, the guy was about 90 years old. He was about 6'2", this frail, frail, frail old guy. I mean, he if I could paint this picture, he looked like he had a suit that was four sizes too big. Um, and, I mean, he was always dressed in, in a suit. He'd come down and he, he would uh, work out of uh, George Lane's office. And, and, you know, he was kind of like, you know, just... You know, this elderly statesman type of individual, and he, he introduced me to really weird stuff like cycles and the Kondratiev wave cycle. And, and so back in, in, in 1980 through 82, I was introduced to all kinds of different forms of technical analysis and esoteric things 
Um, and, and it really did help me to understand, to be, I guess, open-minded and, and to, to expand and explore um, in not just seasonal analysis, but also different forms of analysis, and it's helped my career, obviously. Um, but in any event, this, out of everything I'd have to say, was a pinnacle of my career. So anyway, what, do I, what have I done and what do I put together and how do I, how do I look at, at, at the markets? And um, quite frankly, uh, with Trade Navigator, they have a fantastic seasonal analysis tool, um, which if it's not replicated, copied, or at least uh, other people try to uh, uh, use it. But uh, Trade Navigator really... Uh, does have fantastic analytical tools here. And, and so I rely on some of the seasonal analysis tools that, that is provided in uh, Trade Navigator. Um, I use that seasonal analysis for not just stock indices, but stocks itself, stock sectors, commodities, and forex. I also use a, a probably least understood, underutilized by the masses is relative comparative strength analysis. And I'll share that with you tonight in just a quick second. Indicators that I use, and, and actually the funny thing is, uh, Pete, if you're still there listening, you know this. I had you guys at Genesis include and create the breadth indicators of all the indices. And I remember you asking me, well, why would we do that? And, and you said, do you want me to put that in your private library that you sell? I said, no, just put it in, the, in, in, in Genesis so everyone can use it. Um, and, and, and I'll share that with you tonight because it's not something I charge money for, but I'll certainly share with you. It's been extremely instrumental, and it helps uh, dramatically improve uh, your timing of the market and looking at some of these breadth indicators. So if you are um, tired of hearing the accolades, then stick around because we're going to get to the meat and potatoes in just a minute of, the, of our presentation. So the... Um, the health of the market is always, for me, considered to be uh, volume, but certain volume. And, and I know a lot of people, it's funny, we did a, a seminar in L.A. two months ago, and I said, how many people have been struggling with volume? And about everyone raised their hands because they see the market rallies, uh, you know, and there's no volume, and they think the, the rally is unsustainable, and, and yet there it keeps plugging along. Or they've seen where the market starts to rally, and it's, you know, it looks like there's volume behind it, but yet the volume does not match from what the traditional um, thesis states, and that's that rallies on light volume tend to fade. And uh, of course, when you when you are out of sync with the volume and the price structure of the market, it tends to throw people's uh, uh, trading askew. And one gentleman just raised his hand and he said, I don't really struggle with volume. And I said, why is that? He goes, I gave up on it about five years ago because I kept losing money using volume analysis. And I, and I asked him what he did. And believe it or not, he was, an, he, he was an engineer. So he wasn't someone that he was kind of used to building things. And he actually used, uh, he was, by the way, a Genesis a Trade Navigator user. And um, he says, I kind of created my own things, and he was very interested. In, and, and I'll share with you tonight one indicator that I've been using for, for decades that has been more effective in the last 10 years than ever before. And we'll get into that in just a minute. I have my own moving average, which are proprietary settings. You, many of you may under, relate or remember or heard that I created this little thing called Person's Pivots. We use it in multiple time frames, and I know a lot of people have pivot points. And they use floor trader pivots. But the person's pivot is a filtered moving average system that actually gives you what the market condition should be or is based on current uh, market dynamics based off the high, the low, the close. And under that, it gives an assumption of what the uh, market condition is and then filters out the pivots. In other words, if we're expecting the market to continue to be bullish, it will give you a higher high, higher low reading. It's actually a very effective indicator, a leading price indicator, rather than just using pivots in itself. And I'll share that in just a second. And then, of course, I have my momentum indicators, which are based off of candle or closing prices. And it's based on how a market closes now as compared to past price action, whether it's old highs or old lows. And we have, of course, a last conditional change setup the high close and low close doji pattern. So these are, this may sound like a huge checklist, but in essence, it's really not. Seasonal analysis works on most markets. Relative comparative strength is very critical in identifying um, where the money's coming out of and where the market's going in, the money's going into. 
Um, very easy to construct a, a comparative relative strength. And of course, indicators targeting health and breadth. So let's get uh, jamming here. So I think one of the things that we like to do is you got to have, I always feel as an options trader or as I've been a trader, I always found that if I had better analytical skills, I would be adjusting positions a lot less often. And as my base education was in commodities some 35 years ago, we were pretty much a do or die type analytic market because of the leverage. You were either right, dead right, or dead wrong. And um, I think nowadays a lot of people kind of lose that that art of 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 sense of, of markets by, by getting into all kinds of different option strategies and they, they look at the option theories and Greeks and they, they fail to have analytical skills. And I always believe that if you have better analytical skills, then you can apply the right strategy. So that's what we want to do. Once we identify an opportunity in the market, we now need to explore our risk and reward. And it's, it's another interesting concept that based on market analytics it also helps me to determine what would be a better entry i do not like to buy and i'm sure you guys can relate to this i don't like to buy retail i like to buy wholesale think of it this way if i can buy at a better price even though i've got a great opportunity i'm going to look for the best opportunity if i can buy something on a pullback it doesn't just help me to reduce my risk it helps me to reduce my risk and in essence by reducing my risks, it potentially helps me to increase my position size. So position sizing and having the right trade on is very important. And that's why now that we have that identifying opportunity, if I have a lower reduced risk, what is the percent of my capital that I would put to use? And more importantly, is there a better strategy out there that I can reduce my capital exposure and, and get into perhaps maybe an option position. So that would be the next area is what's the best strategy and what do I do with that newfound knowledge or an opportunity that just uh, happened. And again, last but not least, how do I get into the trade? Am I using limit orders? Is it a market order? Or am I using a stop entry order? And under what condition do I go with the momentum breakout? Because once a market breaks out, you can't chase it. So you have to have specific orders in a, around the specific trade setup that is uh, that determines that. So how do I determine whether a market is ready to move or not? Now this looks like a very colorful graph, but basically what this is, is going back since the beginning of the year, and this is current as of about 15 minutes ago. What I've done in, in looking at, and just so that you can see here, because I know we're gonna run out of time relatively quickly um, let me go back here and look at the PowerPoint to share with you. this uh, purple Barney type color this is the uh, semiconductor sector in year-to-date at one point we were as you can see close to about 30 percent year-to-date we've given this this sector uh, has lost the socks the semiconductor sector has lost about eight percent in the last two weeks um, interestingly enough everyone was getting very bullish on the semis uh, just about two weeks ago in the middle of July. It's like people said, oh, this is the space you want to be in. Well, a, a, a market segment, a sector that has rallied in a very short period of time, and what the whole story you don't see is in the last two years, or not two years, 19 months, the semi sector, the SOX was up close to 60%. So relative, comparative relative strength, what I've done is uh, I'm, I'm t tracking the sectors of the market in not terms of price gains, but percentage changes. And so I can look and say, gee, relative to the semis at this point in time, when I take a look at maybe the XRT or the consumer discretionary, the XLY, which is this fuchsia color way down there, um, we can note that, gee, um, we've got relative, this, this particular uh, market here, this segment of the market, slightly a little bit over accelerated uh, and, and from a relative comparative analysis uh, setup, I can say, gee, what's the seasonal time frame that thing peaks out? Now, if I see that there's a seasonal uh, change in the supply and demand functions, and that typically in July we see the semis peak out, and they're already up year to date about 30%, how many people think that there might be a good trading opportunity there? 
Duh, of course. But now we've got to look for a trigger. Well, I'll tell you right now, there's several sectors that I would watch going forward in the next few weeks. And I'll tell you, it's number one. Um, I always like to give out some solid information for you guys that are attending here. Uh, XRT in the uh, retail apparel sector and the consumer discretionary sector. It's underwater um, even as we uh, speak for today's market segment. Um, we're, we're looking at an area that is as we start to get into August and middle August to uh, about September, this is a segment that starts to gain uh, strength. So we want to be looking at some retail apparel stocks in that segment. Um, one area that I'm definitely staying away from is in technology right now, and so I'll be staying away from that sector still. Um, and so from a relative strength perspective, this kind of chart can say, hey, just like looking at, at tracking a trade, for example, if a market, if the XLY, which as you can see, has just had a little pullback, we are starting to make a pattern here from the year where we are making almost higher highs and higher lows. If the retail or consumer discretionary segment has been underwater and consumers are starting to if they go back out, we want to focus our attention now because this is this is kind of the time of the year where kids go back to school and people start spending money in certain areas. Not all areas, but certain areas. So there is there is some bright spots even in this market environment right now that I think we want to focus our attention to and that's where relative strength analysis can certainly aid. Um, this is actually the difference between the XRT and this is another version of looking at uh, for a confirmation tool. This is comparing the XRT to the S&P 500. So we can take a look at what and again it's not in price terms it's in percentage terms. So we can take a look at a, this is the XRT, as you can see, it's not positive, and this is the S&Ps. So the funny thing is, it's relative, the XRT relative to the S&P 500 has been on a decline, and just in the last week, we're starting to see the relative strength turn in this market segment. So it means that the stock market is going down, this sector is actually holding. So can you imagine when we start to get new buy signals in the market, which I'll talk about in just a minute, I think that this is the sector that it's it's outperforming the market, and that's what this spread chart kind of looks like. It's the XRT relative or compared to the S&P 500. So how does that help you make money? What do you look for? Well, I just said when the overall market stops declining, so there are other tools that we use. Many people, and I'll give this out, and this is something I generally don't do, but I like Pete and you guys are, are Genesis users, so I'm going to give this, uh, many of you probably already know this anyway, but um, most people look at breadth indicators and they look at them as it relates to the New York Stock Exchange, the NYSE. Most trading platforms or most educators will teach you how to use market breadth tools that are based on the NYSE the New York Stock Exchange, Dick Arms, the Arms Index, they all look at the NYSE. The funny thing is, the NYSE, if people just dug a little bit deeper, they would find out that the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, about more than 50% of the stocks contained in that uh, index that everyone's looking to gauge the breadth analysis, um, over 50% of the stocks are interest rate sensitive, meaning preferred stocks, more importantly, bond funds. So you may not get a good or true reading of the advance, the stocks that are advancing versus the stocks that are declining. So take me a little bit more to explain it, but I think some of you, you, you folks are, are maybe appreciative of that information and how that, that can help you because in the last few weeks, you may note that while stocks were going up, so were bond prices. And we may have gotten a false kind of reading with the advanced decline analysis and the N as it relates to the NYSC, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index. This is the tool that I had Genesis create that is available. Is um, I went down and I wanted to find out the advanced decline analysis exclusively on the S&Ps. I wanted to look at an advanced decline comparative analysis on the NASDAQ 100. I wanted to look at the same thing on the Russell, and I wanted to look at the same thing on the Dow. 
quite frankly, we trade different markets, and, and the charts that you see in front of you, this is the daily chart on the ES, the NASDAQ, the Russell as represented by IWM, the NYSE, and the Dow. Down below is uh, the weekly chart on the same markets. This is the weekly analysis. And I have a little moving average, and then next to that I have a little volume tool called On Balance Volume here with a moving average approach, which helps me to determine a bunch of things. A, as everyone was getting really bullish in the stock market here over the last couple weeks, um, we noted that we were, and we warned people, it's been tweeted, it's been text, we've been trading, and we've already been establishing short positions in the market via, if not short, uh, the Russell long inverse ETA like TZA, uh, the inverse ETF on the Russell. Uh, also, we took a, a really nice uh, position here uh, on DOG, D-O-G, which relates an inverse ETF on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. One of the reasons we did DOG was because, as you can see, we broke a little trend line in price, but as we broke that trend line in price, the advanced decline analysis broke down a little bit sharper. And so with that said, we were looking for a bigger decline in the Dow relative to the other markets. The Russell had already been broken, breaking down, so we were looking for, at this point in time, a, a bigger decline coming in the Dow. So more importantly, I think the advanced decline analysis really did show a classic bearish divergence pattern in the sense that prices were making higher highs in not just one stock, but the majority of stock indexes. As you can see, the Dow was making higher highs and the advanced decline wasn't. The NASDAQ was making higher highs and its advanced decline wasn't. The S&Ps were making higher highs and the advanced decline wasn't. As the market started to turn lower, note that as, and even as the price was making higher highs, it was doing so with a negative divergence reading with the on-balance volume indicator. So almost every single index here was giving us confirmation of a turn. That's on the daily basis. It even looked the same on the weekly basis, as you can see. This is pretty, this is pretty powerful information, testifiable information. If we know how to use it and where to get it and how to use it, it's going to help you. Combine that with one of my favorite tools on Genesis is a seasonal trend. So seasonally speaking, the market typically kind of goes down in these markets, everyone has kind of a different seasonal effect. Like, take note of this, friends. The Russell, which began the decline first. All right? Yes, the advanced decline is weakening. Yes, it's been on fairly strong volume as accordance to the OBV indicator. I want you to also recognize that, though, by mid-July, the Russell starts to have a seasonal upturn. The fact that we're near a person's pivot longer-term support, and that's not a monthly support, it's a quarterly support. The fact that we're near that support area, we'll be looking for perhaps a sector rotational correction where the Russell actually kind of bottoms out or, or, or maybe ceases to decline much further, but yet we see other indices kind of uh, retreat a little more. So we will be looking for signs of that moving forward and the tools that we use are these advanced decline comparative ratios as they relate to each individual stock index. So if you're trading S&Ps and you're looking at the NYSE AD lines, you're kind of not getting a full picture of the market and you're not using the full approach of specific technical tools that we have at our disposal. So that's, that's one thing that I think a lot of people need to learn. Another is, uh, this is a uh, comparative ratio chart between, uh, or a spread chart if you want to call it, between the NASDAQ and the S&Ps. And you can note this is a daily chart. Kind of really neat stuff here in the sense that, you know, there are times that we see the NASDAQ relative to the S&Ps on a percentage basis significantly outperform or we get these huge gaps, so to speak, right? And then eventually you see market turns. Obviously, we were seeing another huge gap. And one of the interesting aspects, and I want you to look back here, as you can see, in the it was really the middle of June, the middle of June that we started to get a breakdown in that spread relationship, that we started to see the spread relationship narrow 
as we started to see lower highs and lower lows. So we were actually getting some really neat readings, warning our people, not from the fact that I know every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to come out of the woodwork saying, see, I told you there was a correction. The funny thing is, we were buying this market back in April and May. So it's not like I've been a perma bear. I've been actually from the long side of this market. and I put out one of the few short uh, trade recommendations in about four years. At right here back in June. An other interesting tool that we have to use is the McClellan Oscillator, which is a standard feature in most platforms, including Genesis, and there's several ways that we could look at it. This is a daily chart. We look at uh, significant overbought readings and outer band readings. We have a zero line cross, and if you note here, we actually had a zero line cross in the McClellan Oscillator and now we've gone to an extreme outer band reading over the last couple days here, which probably tend to give us an idea that we're going to see a short-term bounce, you know, uh, maybe in the next day or two. We got to watch that. Um, the longer-term weekly McClellan oscillator suggests that we are probably due for another at least two, three weeks of correction. But that doesn't mean we can't see bounces in the markets along the way. It means we will get bounces. You probably want to focus on selling the rallies and watching the NASDAQ, the technology stocks, not necessarily uh, biotech, but watch the, 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 the technology area, uh, the semis. Look at the hardware, like your SanDisks. Look at your Akamai. Look at you know those type of names that are significantly overbought that might be victim or susceptible for some profit taking or further downside. That's what the McClellan Oscillator, it's a very simple tool to use. There's three components that we look at. Outer band or overbought, oversold readings, zero line crosses, and my favorite, just like any or most technical tools allow us to look at, divergence patterns. So the stock market, while we were looking at the NASDAQ and the SPOOs, the S&Ps that is, making higher highs. Note that the McClellan Oscillator was making a significant lower high. So yes, there were some testifiable uh, evidence denoting that it was time to get at least not tighten up stops, but start, start looking at some aggressive uh, short positions in the marketplace via ETFs or in options and something that we took advantage of doing and something that I think that we still have a shot at doing. Now, this is a blown up photo of the S&Ps as it relates to even including today's action. As you can clearly see, the advanced decline analysis if the stock market, the theory is, if the stock market is so strong, then why are less stocks participating in that rally? And if the stock market is so strong, then why is the volume indicator registering lower readings? So not only that, but if you note the person's pivots, which the person's pivot indicator gives one resistance and it gives one support. And you'll note that while, yes, we have a higher red, higher red, higher red, and higher green, which is the support, note that the market was giving us a higher high yet lower low reading. So that's telling us there is a shift in the market and that we can anticipate downside. The funny thing is we did generate a very nice sell signal and I understand that we had sell signals every once in a while but this sell signal was one that needed to be respected because it came on the heels of a divergence pattern and so I just wanted to share with you what did the blowing this chart up what did it really look like um, you know as we entered the the middle of July you know back over here we note that we made a market that rallied against resistance um, but note that the difference is it, this high that came right here came at a, uh, a confirmation that stocks were associating that strength and it was on a rise in volume. So this was not a 
a cell signal up in here. In fact, we didn't even get a cell signal for that matter. So it really was something that I think is, is a tool that, all right, so let's say you miss this downside, big deal. I think that the good news is that there are tools out there that are working in this environment, and these are the tools that are helping us make better trading decisions. So it's just a matter of brushing up and getting used to these. So you can look at sector analysis in the stock market. If you're trading the stock market or if you're trading commodity markets, if you're trading crude oil, natural gas, um, you know, looking at sector analysis, we like to look at the sector and the commodity and find out the leadership of the group. One thing that we scan for in, in Genesis is my PPS. That's the person's pivot system. It's a momentum buy and sell of those triangles. And we look for scan for buy and sell signals in, in specific sectors. And I use specific volume indicators to confirm. So I wanted to share this chart with you, which includes volume analysis. And, and my point earlier was that sometimes the volume histogram, if you take a look at this chart, I mean, I really don't know what volume does when you look at the trend of the market, how it can help an investor nowadays versus looking at Joe Granville's indicator called on balance volume. But I mean, I can go back and I'll show you a few examples, but I'd rather show you example in current market conditions, right, what's happening right now. And if you note that, you know, back here in May, we had a nice strong trend in price and it was on a, a, an association of accumulation of, of stocks advancing, confirming that strong move. There was a strong broad-based rally going on. And the on-balance volume was trending higher. Note that it broke out above its moving average right here. So it was moving up. But if you're not using this tool, and you're not using this tool, and you're relying solely on volume, I bet you were struggling because most people would say, hey, this market's rallying. And it's on light volume. It can't go any higher. And zoop, it kept going up. And that's where I think a lot of people have been struggling in the market because they're using old tools and they don't understand the disconnect. In fact, the market continued to make a move up. We continue to see aggressive move with the AD line. We continue to see an aggressive move with on balance volume. But yet the volume continued to fake people out. And, you know, as we got into July, now the market's not doing anything. Advanced decline's going down. On balance volume's going down. And that's probably why people thought that the stock market was going to go up forever because it started to move on increase in volume. And actually, that was probably within one, two, three, four, five days of a top. And then, of course, here we are right now. So what gives? I don't know if anyone can relate to that, but I got a little test for you. Is the trend of on balance volume and and the volume histogram in sync with the price of this stock? And this stock is it's a bank stock. But what I'm asking is you guys can see the trend in price is going up, the trend in on balance volume is going up and the trend of volume is going up. The market went down, volume all BV went down and the volume histogram on average went down. The price went back up, OBV went up, and guess what? So did the volume histogram. And then all of a sudden you got a little minor correction. On balance volume sure is defining that trend. And yep, there's the volume. It defined that trend too. And then all of a sudden we started to see the rise in on balance volume, rise in regular volume, and price rallied. So my, my question again stands, is the trend of on balance volume and the volume in sync with price? And the answer is obviously yes. It's a loaded question. All right, so let's look at something real quick. Same company. Same company, same symbol. Stock price rises. On balance volume goes up. Volume goes down. Uh, what's going on here? Price goes sideways to lower. Volume, uh, on balance volume goes sideways to a little lower. Volume goes up. Price goes up. On balance volume goes up. Price volume trend goes down. Is the trend of on balance volume and volume in sync with price? And the answer is, in this example, heck no. No way, right? So if you're wondering what gave, I don't know if that got your attention. But if you struggle with volume analysis in this day and age, 
you're not alone, and there is a rhyme and a reason why we're not looking at volume except for maybe an individual day to look for maybe a, uh, a capitulation, a high volume key reversal, something like that. Um, another good useful tool for volume is to find out if there's any liquidity in the market of the stock or the product that you're trading. But to define the trend is probably not as helpful as it's been written in the history books in, in the last few years. And here's the reason. Let's go back and say when on balance volume and volume was working, guess what? Note the time of the year. It was kind of a trick question. Note that in the time period that the volume was working or it was in sync with prices, okay, if you notice that, you'll note that it's pre-2005 days. Interesting. So now what about this chart? That this is actually kind of funny. Note that this, it stops working post-2005. So what gave? What's the big switch? And this is what I've been teaching for a half a decade. Volume versus trend of volume. As more and more traders and more and more hedge funds and more and more people are getting involved with options, more and more institutions are using dark pools, there's less and less, there's more ways to mask or hide the volume. And so with that said, it doesn't give a general calculation like it once used to, whereas the on-balance volume might give you a better trend reading of the market. And there are some nuances within on-balance volume that people need to use. You can, number one, apply a moving average to it to help you to find out, are you breaking out above the average, in this case, seven period, uh, which is a very tight moving average to use, but nonetheless, um, if you note that we have on balance volume registering a breakout and you get a PPS, that green arrow is a buy signal, so you're starting to see a buy signal on a rise or breakout of volume. So that would be a very valid buy signal versus looking at this volume, it says it doesn't tell you to get in that trade. It shows that the volume is, is drying up on this market. In fact, if you notice that, look where it was saying even in this rally right here, there was no volume behind the move. And all of a sudden, sure enough, there was. It just kept going. So I have to tell you, folks, that if you've been struggling in the markets, it's um, you know there are some tools out there. You just have to be taught how to use these tools, where to find these tools, more importantly, when to apply these tools. And I think that there, there's, there's a lot of great information. Um, so a question was, uh, is this advanced decline indicator in Trade Navigator? And the question is, the answer is yes, as I, I have already explained. So maybe you came in late and didn't hear me. I had Pete actually put these in Trade Navigator. So it's nothing that uh, you have to buy. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to point out to you is if we take a look at the market, uh, th this there's several stocks here up on my screen. Obviously, we got Intel, we got Yum Brands, Apple, Urban Outfitters, Retail Apparel. Uh, we have Goldman Sachs, we have Walmart, MGM, Aflac, we have McDonald's, and we have eBay. If you'll note here that some widely held markets such as McDonald's, um, you know, it, it's it's actually started to move significantly lower and on a strong downtrend in the marketplace. Aflac, uh, right against this uh, longer term pivot analysis, as you can see, well, Aflac just came down. Not only did it hit our longer term resistance, it just came down to support. But boy, I'll tell you what, we got a sell signal and this market started to decline right and then, of course, gap lower and has kept going. Uh, this is MGM. MGM, I like it longer term, but from a seasonal perspective, it, it might run into trouble over the next few weeks from a seasonal perspective. Walmart, um, you know what? Just formed today, if you, if you look at this, a doji. I'd be looking for a trigger if Walmart is going to behave in a bullish fashion in the retail space. Uh, Walmart uh, should give us a clue over the next couple days. This is Intel. 
Intel came right at our pivot resistance. And this isn't just any pivot, it's the predicted pivot. You'll note that I only get one support and one resistance. Um, and the funny thing is, people kind of lose perspective of, is that this is a the pivot point and that gold or yellow, this one is a moving average. And so basically what we look at is the relationship of that moving average, something that I'd have to explain in another time, or you guys can certainly read about this information. But the person's pivot's been a dynamic indicator in not just determining support and resistance functions, but determining the market condition. Another thing it helps with is to help on entry prices. So I, I think that combining the tools, um, one of the things that I, before getting uh, off the subject of pivots, I wanted to, to finish with the uh, volume. If you'll note, Urban Outfitters, uh, the market's in a trend upward. Look at the volume histogram, volume on balance volume. It's trending upward. This is eBay, which defied gravity, and eBay is moving up. Both are considered potentially consumer discretionary stocks, by the way. And then I'm looking at uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, and note that we're starting to sell off that resistance, and look at the trend direction of the OBV. I don't know about you, but I don't know what the hell this thing tells you to do. This this volume here, good luck with that, folks. And more importantly, uh, Apple, which has had resistance, um, as the market starts to, to show signs of struggle here, the key is it's kind of in that consumer discretionary space, technology space. Um, you know, Apple certainly needs uh, a little bit more bullish uh, work. We've got a breakdown in the on balance volume, which suggests we, we might get another dip down possibly to 92 and change. Intel, as Intel started to move off of this pivot predicted resistance, we actually got one of my uh, famous low close doji triggers on Intel and we're finally seeing that roll over. I mean, I feel bad for all the folks that may be watching CB, CNBC getting trade uh, recommendations. Maybe they're doing okay, I don't know. but. Um, I, that wasn't a fair statement, but I do know this, that uh, from a seasonal aspect, this is now the, like the worst time of the year to be buying in this in this space. And as you note from the relative strength chart that I shared with you, I mean, if you got the inkling to buy Intel now after it's had this dynamic move over the last two years, and now you finally got the gumption to buy Intel up against that pivot resistance, I'd have to say, I think using comparative relative strength pivot analysis it would help you to maybe say you know what i think we're going to get a better entry over the next 90 days so i hope you guys uh uh you know at least take a look at that the the interesting aspect is we got this gap here that the market will want to fill eventually it's wide enough to, to to run a train set through and then don't forget we've got this other one down in here which I think by the September, let me back that up, by October expiration, I think we come in and fill that gap. Um, remember, here's another thing. Gaps don't have to be filled 100%. 50% of the way is considered a filling of a gap. So needless to say, we are starting to see a breakdown in the volume with the trend direction of this uh, market. And I think relative strength would say, hey, some of these stocks are high flying, and some of these stocks are low flying. That's the relative strength of saying what's going on in, in, the, uh, in the essence of retail apparel. When we take a look at another little silly name which had a big move today, which was something we were talking about, which is American Eagle Outfitters. I mean, it, it's not a big deal. It's up, uh, you know, if you think about it, a, a, a 44 cent move on a $10 stock. Another one is Amber Crombie and Fitch, a and F. You'll note that it too had a really nice uh, move over the last couple of days. It's defying gravity. So what I get out of this is from the comparative relative strength information I shared with you, what it shows to me is that while the equity market is going down and a lot of the high flyers are getting froth, we're seeing kind of like a, a, a sneaky sector rotational grind and a change of ownership or leadership coming in the market. So another essence is some of the names that I just popped up, ANF and also AEO, are, are small cap stocks and they're contained in the Russell. So again, the Russell, remember what I said earlier, the Russell kind of by middle of the month, it, it, it shows a little bit of strength. So all of this information that I'm sharing with you tonight, 
it helps to confirm where my focus of attention should be. And armed with that information, I might be able to run scans now. And that's one of the neat things that we, we can do. We can run a scan in the market. Oh, what a thought. And, and, and that's one of the neat things about Genesis. Uh, we've created several scan. Um, for example, this is uh, uh, stocks. I'll just share this one with you. Um, we came in with, um, as you can see, the last time I ran the scan here, we had a nice uh, little buy signal in Urban Outfitters. Another one was Priceline, which you know had a, a very significant move to the upside. Another one that defied gravity. Um, Intel, which did generate that little buy signal, but it's a buy signal at resistance. I'm not interested in that. Actually, it's in a sector that I don't want to be in. I don't want to be in technology right now because of its seasonal and relative strength performance in the market. So we can run scans in the market the, for looking for uh, high probability setups. And I have all types of scans that I've uh, created, like stocks. This might be interesting as a breadth indicator. How many stocks right now in the S&P 500 are below their 50-day moving average? We have 304. Um, boy, that's kind of important information. How many stocks are above their 10-day moving average? 112. You know, just two weeks ago, that number was uh, 342. We've seen that many stocks pull off their 10-day uh, moving average. So it's obviously we're seeing a, 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 a widespread correction in the market. So none, needless to say, 384 stocks are now below their 10-day moving average. What that kind of shares with me is that the, a lot of these names, they were a little overbought to begin with, and now we're seeing them correct. So what I'll be watching for in the next few uh, days, in the next two weeks, is I'm going to be looking for trading opportunities alongside in specific sectors, namely XRT for one, and I'll be looking for some quality names that are maybe getting a little oversold, and an oversold condition would be stocks below their 50-day moving average. One such name is, not that I'm telling anyone to get into it, but Yum Brands, which, I mean, this is, it's kind of funny, but would you believe me if I told you that somewhere, somewhere in here, somewhere, I don't know if it was this day, that day, this day, somewhere in here, believe it or not, I'm sure it's something that we can go back and look at videos, but someone in there, an analyst on a major financial TV station, said that this was a great company that the market was, pro uh, they, they resolved their problems with the chicken in China. They went on this little tear about that, and that Yum Brand is, uh, could easily see $100. And I just went, wow, that's a bold call. But needless to say, um, you know, Yum Brand, the funny thing is, you know, if they loved it at 81 or 82 bucks, I wonder how they feel now that it's trading near 69 as it just filled the gap in here, right? So I think it's important that if if we're going to be looking at stocks, if you if you like a company from good fundamentals, that's one thing, but we want to make sure that we're buying some good opportunity and we want to make sure, or we got great selling opportunity one way or another, it's important to use uh, some, some uh, proper technical tools to help identify these opportunities. So anyway, this is the kind of stuff that I use, folks. Many of you are familiar with my person's pivot indicator. I think many of you are familiar with our, our, our buy and sell signals that we've created as an indicator. Um, if not, um, what I will tell you is you can simply, one thing that we'll offer you guys here, if you're interested in our website, we have a slew of trading courses, uh, number one, that are available. Our original trading course here for $89 as a special. We have our advanced traders course, which I find to be probably one of the, the best courses that will stand uh, the test of time. Stock Trading Simplified was a fantastic uh, course for intermediate to advanced traders. And of course, Options Trading Simplified. I've had that course. It's just a, a dynamic course that it incorporates some technical analysis, but also gives people 
some great insights as to the proper strategies to employ, what to look for as far as implied volatility, historic volatility, when to apply my favorite directional trade setups, um, you know, stock replacement uh, strategies, as well as uh, another really uh, uh, popular strategy that I don't hear people utilizing is called a ratio back spread. A ratio back spread, very dynamic directional trade setup. But needless to say, anyone that is interested in, if you take advantage of the courses, if you would like as Trade Navigator clients, we will also let you have a 30-day test run for free with the purchase of a course, a 30-day trial to our indicator package if you are interested in. So to get some dynamic education and to get some dynamic information on some of the technical tools that you're, if you're not using, are very applicable in this day and age. And what's, what's working in the market, I think is something that everyone will certainly enjoy. If you're interested, Pete uh, has just uh, put the link there for everyone. If you go to the website, you will find at Persons Planet, you have to click on that specific link, personsplanet.com forward slash trading.html. If you do not use that specific link, then you will get my regular website. And if you say, well, I'll just go to the store uh, and I'll just buy a course. And so you will be um, looking at, so for example, the advanced trading course, which is 489 and not the special price that we've uh, put together for uh, Trade Navigator subscribers. So that's why this is a very private link so that you need that specific link. In addition, we will make sure that you get a 30-day um, trial. The course materials, at least for the advanced trading course, includes not just how to read seasonal analysis, but of course it's uh, how to use it within Trade Navigator, my breadth and volume analysis, my pivot points, my moving average method of using pivot points, uh, specific setups and triggers, including my last conditional change indicator, as well as the high close, low close doji. And uh, all of that information and these courses you can find at personsplanet.com forward slash trading dot html. I would sincerely tell you to take advantage of that. This is dynamic information, and it's stuff that's actually it's it's hysterical because it's it's time tested and it's working in this environment. And you know what's funny is everyone says it's different. And you know there is an old adage that we were even saying in our own trading room last week. It's funny because you if you have the news on, you notice that everyone has to get long the market. They are all in. And I go, man, all I can remember is this favorite phrase: buy it when nobody wants it and sell it when everyone's got to have it. And if, unless you've been on a, 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 a vacation to Mars, you've got to understand there's a lot of people that have got really bullish in the last, just, just as recently as two weeks ago. And the funny thing is, the markets were demonstrating that weakness. So um, anyway, I think there will be a turn. We've got an exciting year ahead. We've got volatility in the market. They've been saying that volatility has been dead. And the funny thing is the volatility has not been dead. The volatility VIX index was dead in the S&Ps. But we've been seeing for the last 19 months insane volatilities in individual stocks. Look at the quarter. Look at the earnings of the last year. The last four quarter, uh, last four earnings have been just incredible volatility for individual stocks. So we've seen movements in crude oil, movements in the grain, movements in feeder cattle, for gosh sakes, movements in live cattle. So there has been a lot of exciting trading opportunities. But everyone, I think that there, as there is always opportunities for making money, that also comes with the opportunity to lose. So be prepared, number one. Understand specific trading strategies, setups, triggers, and where your stops going. I think our trading courses will do that for you. So we actually go through top to bottom what triggers a trade, how and when to enter orders, when to exit. And I don't mean how to enter a, a limit order. I'm talking about when do you place a stop in entry and where's your stop loss go and how do you determine profit objectives. Some of my favorite setups are explained in full detail in these trading courses. So in any event, I wanted to say thanks to Pete. Thank you for letting me be here. I hope you got something out of uh, the presentation and uh, great information there, as well as what indicators are working, which is the topic of today's discussion. So with that said, Pete, thank you for letting me be here. If you wanted to just bang around the website, go visit us at PersonsPlanet.com. 
And if you are interested, grab yourself one of those packages. They're awesome. Sure. Well, on balance volume, as you note that the funny thing is for foreign currencies in, in that Forex course, I explain exactly how you can use a, um, a volume indicator. In, if you're trading the, the uh, Forex market, you know, it's tough to get the uh, volume. So if you're trading Forex, and I don't know, you know, whoever you're trading uh, through, it doesn't matter. But the funny thing is, is when you trade Forex, right, you got to understand that the futures, there's just a slight difference variation of uh, market um, differences between a foreign currency Forex product and the foreign currency futures product. So what I always try to share with people is if, for example, I go and I just briefly do this for you. If you're using um, the uh, Genesis, if I compare an apple to an apple, the tools that I use for my indicators work extremely well for Forex, um, number one. But if you're looking at some of the other tools like the on balance volume, certainly you, why can't you have two charts next to each other? They almost look identical in the fact that this is a daily chart on the futures and that's a daily chart on the spot Forex market. So the key in, in what I would tell you is that if I go up here and I'm going to edit chart, I'm going to show you how to do this real quick to answer your question. If I go up to add here real quick, add an indicator to a selected pane, and I'm going to scroll on down the line here. Just read it on down. I'll beat it on down the line. I think you'll see OBV is right there. Hit add. Okay. So, you know, the, the, the key is if you're looking at day trading in the market, and I want to change this over to a five minute chart. Let's try to load there. Let's get going. Oh, that's what we're doing. We're updating. Ay, yeah, yeah. That's always tough in a presentation, right guys? So I'm going to just I'm actually change my mind. I'm going to go 60 minute here. I'm going to change this to a 60 minute because day trading and using the on balance volume indicator, whether you're trading the Forex or the futures, you can always use the futures data for that volume analysis, right? And almost, if you take a look at this, this is a, a 60 minute chart and we've got two 60 minute time periods. You'll note that we generated a sell signal at 0400 hours in the futures. And note here, we generated the same signal in the Forex market at exactly the same time. So they trade almost tick for tat. You just got to know the nuances. So can they work for Forex? Yes, if you know how to do uh, and, and set your charts up for it? The answer is yes. So that was a long-winded yes. I apologize. But I wanted you to see the difference between the futures and the forex. Um, yes, we'll, yeah, we'll keep that up. Um, what's today? It's... Um, uh, we'll probably keep that. Yeah, yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, what is today? It's uh, actually we're trading Wednesday night. It's Wednesday's trading session already. Um, you know, folks, the funny thing is this will be up through the weekend. All right, we said through the weekend. This will be up through the weekend. So you'll have a chance to go through that Sunday. And you know what? As a client of Trade Navigator, if if it if for some reason the link doesn't work or you, you wanted to get it and you couldn't, something had to happen, send us an email. Hey, I heard your thing on, on uh, Trade Navigator. Would you extend that offer to me? We, you know, We'll be very, very kind to do that for you.